Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Daniel Hagigi. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, today. Uh, we're going to be uh, discussing uh, some considerations uh, for a crystal science approach. Um, it's nice to do this from my home. I'm uh, here in uh, Washington State. Uh, Washington State uh, in the U.S. is, uh, for those outside of the area, outside the U.S., uh, it's a, well, I think it's an awesome place to live. Uh, uh, rain and snow in the cask, rain in uh, the oceans on the west side, deserts and sun on the east side, and fantastic climbing uh, in the Cascades here and uh, uh, throughout the uh, state from top to bottom. Um, today, uh, we're going to be spending uh, some time learning how uh, some considerations in a crystal approach for science lift. Uh, I do quite a bit of mountaineering, as you may have guessed. Um, I show this slide a lot of uh, programs to start with. Uh, refer to it uh, conveniently as a smart belay. Uh, this was taken on the Cassine Ridge on Denali uh, in Alaska, Mount McKinley. Uh, and uh, it was kind of a desperate pitch. I was out of gear, uh, out of protection, and I uh, threw together a snow picket here, which is a two-foot uh, giant tent stake. And uh, some runners and, and other bits and pieces of uh, rope to make a, a very decent belay to bring my uh, friend over. And um, there's no mountaineering books that tell you how to make a belay like this. Uh, none. Nothing. There's, it's, it's, this was something I had to uh, just create very quickly, but I was able to do it safely because I understood what it is I was trying to do. And uh, I'm hoping at the end of the program here, you'll have a better understanding than on how to approach uh, a crestal sinus lift and make some informed decisions on how you can best help uh, your patients. Uh, the case today uh, will be case presentation format. Uh, we'll be discussing Sarah's case. Uh, Sarah uh, required uh, implants in the positions of uh, her upper first molars, uh, tooth numbers uh, 3 and 14 in the U.S. system. I'd like to give a thanks to Implant Compare for having us today and uh, to uh, surgical core implants. So this is uh, Sarah, she presented on uh, consult uh, initially. She was wanting to have uh, implants placed in the, the areas of uh, three, uh, upper right first molar and 14. Uh, she didn't want to have a uh, bridge, obviously wasn't interested in a partial. Um, and so, uh, she was wondering what would it take to have this completed. So uh, the first thing that has to happen is uh, we have to decide, can she actually have teeth in that area? Uh, does, a, does a crown, does the prosthetic fit? Um, now, this is important because um, if the space is too large, uh, you can create some cantilevering forces that make it very, very difficult uh, to have a good long-term success for uh, the implant. This is overlooked quite a bit. Uh, typically on a uh, molar uh, site, uh, getting past 10 uh, to 11 millimeters becomes problematic because of uh, uh, the, the uh, cantilevering forces you'll have on the mesial, distal, buccal, and lingual of the uh, crown. So in this case, it works out very nicely. She was about 10 millimeters on either side. Uh, even looking at uh, force multipliers, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very significant. Um, if you're loading axially, then uh, you're putting compressive forces on the bone. A bone tolerates compressive forces very well. It was built to take compressive forces, okay? Um, as we start to do, uh, as we start to have the implants uh, uh, angled, we start increasing uh, the forces on them, and that puts all the forces on the crestal bone. It starts uh, placing then uh, more force, uh, uh, non-compressive forces. Uh, we have torsional forces and tensile forces. These torsional and tensile forces then uh, can cause uh, significant uh, problems with the crestal bone, and they're uh, multiplied uh, dramatically by increasing the angle, as you can see. Uh, from the first, second, and third diagram. So that leaves a couple decisions then when you're playing a case. Um, typically, and unfortunately still to this day, many providers are looking at implant dentistry uh, as a surgical procedure. And, and, and realistically, uh, implant dentistry is a uh, 
prosthetic procedure, but it has a surgical component. Uh, we need to really understand what is the prosthetic we're going to make, uh, what are the, what's the prosthetic space requirements for that. And then uh, once we know uh, where all those components fit in three dimensions in the arch, then we can determine uh, the 3D position of the implant. Otherwise, we end up with a, a horribly cantilevered crown um, or trying to fit something into a space that just doesn't fit. So in this case, we know that uh, uh, prosthetic space uh, is good. Uh, we should make some considerations to how much prosthetic space we need. Uh, so we have the, the crown prosthetic space. But we also need a prosthetic space for um, the abutment uh, connection to the implant. And that, that will dictate where the level of the implant is. Typically for a bone level implant, which is what we're using, crest level implant today, uh, you need to have, uh, you should typically plan on having about a minimum of six millimeters of um, clinical crown space for the crown and uh, plan to have the uh, implant about three millimeters apical to the planned gingival margin. So if the planned gingival margin is going to match here, uh, we'd want to have the implant placed three millimeters up from this area. And then we need a minimum of about five to six millimeters here. So totally total distance, you're looking anywhere from eight to nine millimeters from the platform of the implant to the occlusal plane. Uh, this is a pre-op planning. Uh, this is our scans, uh, screenshots of scans from um, uh, Serona software. Um, uh, very handy software, easy to use. Uh, it gives very quick 3D planning. Um, I would really recommend, uh, even for a crestal approach, uh, having some um, 3D imaging is, is very helpful. Uh, one of the concerns are septa, uh, and depending where the septa are, and depending on the uh, depending on the uh, shape of the sinus floor, that can have some bearing on on how you want to uh, how you want to approach the case. Uh, in future presentations, uh, we'll be discussing um, uh, some lateral window approaches, and you'll see that one of the considerations actually were uh, the sinus anatomy. And although, uh, uh, although the patient had uh, enough alveolar crestal bone volume uh, for a crestal approach uh, uh, sinus lift, uh, because of the patient's uh, sinus anatomy and septa orientation, uh, lateral approach was uh, dictated. And then on her left side as well, um, you can see that she has uh, bone volume to work with uh, for the implant, yet we still need, even with, I think this is an eight millimeter uh, mock-up, uh, the implant needs to be placed uh, somewhat into the maxillary sinus. So maxillary sinus augmentation, uh, what is it? Well, essentially, we want to be able to go from something like this to something like this, okay? We want to be able uh, to create bone uh, where there is no bone. Uh, when teeth are removed, uh, one of the unfortunate consequences is uh, pneumonizations of the sinus. And what that simply means is that due to the positive pressure in the sinus, uh, the sinus slowly expands. Uh, there, are own, there are no teeth roots uh, anymore to uh, prevent that expansion. And so not only do you have loss of alveolar uh, height uh, intraorally, uh, uh, moving superiorly, we also have inferior movement of the sinus due to pneumonization. So we want to try and replace some of this uh, alveolar bone volume. So we're going to be working in the sinus. We should just have a quick working understanding of what the sinus is. Um, uh, there are all sorts of sinuses, so we should really refer to this as a maxillary sinus. Uh, for our presentation, um, uh, purposes, uh, we're going to just do a very quick review for this crestal approach uh, in the lateral window programs that we'll be giving sub subsequent lateral approach uh, science lifts that we'll be going over subsequently in other programs. We'll spend a bit of detailed uh, time uh, going through science anatomy. We're going to discuss uh, this area here. Uh, this is the osteum, the osteum or OMC osteomedial complex that connects basically the, sin the uh, nasal sinus to the maxillary sinus. This is important. And then um, looking for any type of uh, uh, odd uh, shapes or septa, 
which are bony protrusions in the sinus uh, or looking for any type of uh, inflammation of the sinus membrane. And we're going to keep it uh, to a very rudimentary evaluation today. Um, so this is typically, again, what we have is osteomedial complex. Uh, this is, uh, again, the connection between the nasal sinus and uh, the maxillary sinus. This is the Schneiderian membrane. Okay. Uh, cancellous bone, I guess there should be a layer of cortical bone here, gingiva, uh, zygomatic arch, floor of the orbit, uh, eyeball, uh, turbinates, and uh, that's about it. I think most of you know about the enamel of the dentin. Huh, we're stuck here for one second. Hold on just a sec. Oh. There we go. Um, and we're gonna take a look at this area now a little bit more closely. So um, when you look at the sinus, uh, the Schneiderian membrane, which is what we're going to be working around, um, it really is a mucoperiosteal membrane. And what that means, it's periosteum on the bottom and ciliated uh, lung epithelium on the top. Uh, the cil cilia move uh, debris um, um, toward uh, the osteum to get to have it removed. Um, so this is really a peri this is really periosteum. Uh, a lot of people will approach a Snyderian membrane and think that it's something different, but realistically, it is um, the membrane is uh, uh, periosteum uh, with a muco with a mucus lining on on top of it. So what's interesting about this is that uh, Boyne in 1980 found that uh, in uh, sorting out uh, Lefort 1 fractures, um, that interestingly enough, when the membrane was ripped, it would repair in such a way sometimes that um, uh, bone was being regenerated underneath the uh, uh, Schneiderian membrane. And whenever it was lifted or tented up, uh, bone formation was occurring. Um, without any tenting, uh, there wasn't any bone formation. And since that time then, um, it's become apparent that if for somehow we're able to lift this periosteum, which is what we're doing, it's to start talking about that in that fashion, this periosteum off of the um, uh, floor of the sinus, the osteogenic potential, the, the ability to grow bone is quite strong. So hundreds of techniques have been developed uh, to do this, uh, and we'll talk about um, essentially uh, two ways to kind of approach this thinking. So we want to do this. We want to place a dental implant into the alveolar crest, but we don't want to place it into the sinus cavity. We want to have it underneath the periosteum, and how are we going to choose that? How are we going to go about that? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Um, Really, I mean, if you think about it uh, systematically, we have to access the alveolus. We have to get to the bone somehow, uh, the, the alveolar bone. Um, once we've gotten to the alveolar bone, we need to get to the sinus cavity, so the Schneiderian membrane, and we need to manipulate that somehow. Once we've manipulated that, we have to decide what are we going to do to push it up. Uh, if you remember uh, the uh, early research, uh, demonstrated that uh, that once the membrane was lifted, uh, bone formation would grow. So how how do we lift it? What do what do we do to make it stay lifted? Um, and then do you place an implant, uh, dental implant, at that time, um, or do you wait? And then uh, how do you close everything up? How do you make it? How do you make it nice and neat? So we're going to talk about a crestal approach. Uh, we're going to talk about how to come in uh, from underneath. To do this, I'm, I'm going to uh, discuss a very uh, uh, safe and effective way to do this. Uh, uh, that doesn't. Uh, that's it's a simple approach. Um, a lot of times in dentistry, things get overcomplicated. Uh, people try to make uh, kits. Uh, they try to make systems uh, to dumb it down, uh, to try and take the thinking out of it. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the program. Uh, with a little bit of uh, forethought, planning, and uh, some, you can develop the clinical expertise uh, to safely do these procedures in your office predictably um, uh, using your brain much more than uh, a kit. So one option is uh, osteotomes. Osteotomes are essentially uh, hammers and mallets. Um, 
they have uh, some significant uh, comorbidities associated with them. Uh, you have instance of significant headache, uh, labyrinthinitis, uh, which is uh, labyrinth is uh, uh, a structure in the inner ear. Uh, lo- many times it's inflamed uh, from uh, viral infections, bacterial infections. It can cause dizziness, headache. Uh, It can also have uh, inflammation uh, due to uh, blunt force trauma, uh, such as osteotomes, and uh, positional vertigo. So uh, the malleting is, is, it's it's not that, it's not that pushing the floor of the sinus is wrong, pushing up the floor of the sinus is wrong. Um, It's that the way that it's done with malleting is, is not ideal. You know, you can buy a sinus lift kit, and there are kit after kit after kit after kit available. Everybody has the latest and greatest kits. There are balloons. Uh, there are sal- there are, you, you can inject saline into the sinus. There are special burrs. Uh, everyone, wh- this one's a sinus master, so evidently you are a sinus master. I guess like Kung Fu Panda. Uh, you have... Uh, uh, saline injections uh, for some of these. They have special burrs that don't cut. These kits are very expensive. They're used just for one approach. And, you know, honestly, um, you don't need uh, to do that, um, in my opinion. Um, what happens with these kits, too, is uh, is uh, something called risk homeostasis. And I think in, in all forms of dentistry, and we have to be aware of this, is that uh, folks... Uh, distributors out there, they just want to sell equipment. They want to sell sell you kits, and they want to sell you things. And so they'll tell you that there's a benefit to owning these things. Um, and we can get lulled uh, into complacency. Uh, risk homeostasis was um, uh, something coined by a Canadian researcher. He had a uh, he he wanted to see how people uh, assessed um, psychologists wanted to see how people assessed uh, uh, risk in their lives, and so. Uh, they did a simple test, actually. They uh, went to Germany and uh, took 100 cabbies, and they gave 50 of them um, high-performance brakes and 50 of them regular brakes in their cabs. Didn't tell anyone who had what and for a year and just monitored what happened. And sure enough, uh, after a year, the people with the high-performance brakes had, as you would expect, less accidents. Uh, the brakes actually made a difference. And we know that now because, I mean, uh, anti-lock brakes are uh, ubiquitous on all cars here in North America. The next year, they went back and uh, they gave 100 different cabbies and they gave 50 of them high-performance brakes and they gave um, 50 of them regular brakes. And this time they told everybody who had what. And believe it or not, uh, at the end of the test, there were, at the end of the year, there were twice as many accidents in the folks with the high-performance brakes. And the idea being is that these folks with the high-performance brakes did more reckless activities because they thought they were protected by, they had the false assumption that they were protected by uh, the brakes. So uh, my point is, um, there's nothing wrong in getting a kit. Absolutely not. Uh, What's important though, is you have to understand how, why this kit was made in the first place. Why, what is it trying to do? And once you understand exactly what the kit is trying to do and understand what it is you're trying to do, it it really doesn't matter what you use. Um, uh, I would stay away. Uh, I would. Uh, I would stay away um, from um, using osteotomes, though, because there is significant comorbidities associated with those. These kits, if you want to use them, um, that's your choice, obviously. Um, but as I mentioned, I think that there are better ways uh, to do this. Uh, the important thing being, though, across the board, is understanding what is the kit is doing and why it's it's doing it. So we're going to discuss basically how to use screws uh, to impact the sinus floor today, Uh, expansion screws specifically. Expansion screws are uh, very cheap and inexpensive. They can use for a variety of procedures. Um, uh, Mostly everything that you can use a chisel and mallet for, a chisel uh, or an osteotome and mallet, you can uh, do uh, with expansion screws plus more. Uh, They're very kind and easy to use for the patient. Um, And we'll detail uh, some uh, straightforward methodology and how to do this. And it, we'll also be doing this, uh, we'll discuss a bit about using uh, concentrated growth factors, PRF, CGF, uh, for depending where you are uh, in the uh, world uh, for the terminology. 
Um, also, piezo surgery. Uh, I use piezo surgery quite a bit in my office. Um, piezo surgery is quite handy. Uh, piezo surgery um, uh, allows uh, for crystal approach. Also, I think it's very technique sensitive. This was uh, these are tips and technique pioneered by uh, Dr. Son, uh, who's in Korea, he's a very uh, talented uh, surgeon. Uh, uh, just, uh, just volumes of uh, literature and and clinical and and academic contributions to uh, implant dentistry and uh, grafting procedures. Um, uh, he's developed a, a nice tip uh, to use for crestal approach using piezo surgery. Again, I find that uh, a little bit more technique sensitive. Um, we will use piezo surgery in in this case presentation to uh, get where we're headed. Uh, however, uh, but not in this fashion. Uh, Dr. Stone's uh, use of piezo surgery, essentially the sinus floor is uh, accessed with a piezo tip. And uh, once it is accessed with a piezo tip, uh, saline is lightly irrigated. Uh, in Two vents are made, uh, one entrance and one exit, and saline is lightly uh, injected into this, which uh, dissects the membrane, the periosteum, uh, from the floor of the sinus, making it very loose. And then um, concentrated growth factors are packed into that area. Um, uh, piezo surgery, the reason that it works so nicely, for those of you who are familiar with it, uh, piezo surgery is an instrument uh, that uh, works much like a cavitron or ultrasonic scaler, in a sense. It uses sonic energy. Uh, sonic energy, uh, uh, the number of frequencies and the power behind it it can be manipulated so that it is more specific to cutting bone, for instance, than cutting tissue. So it makes it, uh, with a piezo unit, for instance, using piezo surgery, one of the things that you can do, it's done in many demos, we use it in the courses I teach for piezo surgery, and you can take a raw egg and uh, scrape, off of, scrape off the shell without breaking the membrane underneath the egg with a piezo unit. So it's very kind to of soft tissue, and I would actually highly recommend any of you uh, interested in uh, who aren't familiar with piezo surgery, it should become part of the armamentarium uh, you have in your uh, practice. So, you know, one of the things that uh, happens, oops, I'm missing a T here. Um, Ole Jensen um, has this in a book of his on sinus graphs. I can't seem to find the, uh, I don't have the uh, uh, reference, but he has, a, Ole Jensen written a book of uh, just a few years ago called The Sinus Graft. And uh, one of the statements he makes in, uh, in the text uh, is that uh, many practitioners think that a transcrustal approach is less invasive, and so they don't need to know how to do a lateral window. Um, and this is uh, his opinion, and, and I am in complete agreement with this, is that, that that's not a good way to approach this. Um, you know, a transcrustal approach is a blind approach. Um, you need to know how to fix things if, if you're doing them. Uh, a good way to look at that is, um, let's say that you're having, uh, you have cholecystitis, so you have a gallbladder that is bad, and you go to the hospital, you see your surgeon, and she says, uh, she goes, Dr. Higigi, I'm gonna remove your gallbladder, I'm gonna do this with a laparoscope, it's a, I'm gonna do this with a camera, essentially, uh, and we're gonna make just three incisions into your belly, uh, we're gonna put in a little saline, I'm going to use a camera, I'll snip the gallbladder out, and we done in a minute, you'll be back at work in four days. I wake up, I ask her how it went, and she goes, well, not so good. And I go, why not? She goes, well, I kind of got lost in there with the camera. I couldn't really make out the anatomy. Your, your gallbladder was in bad shape. Um, and I don't know how to do an open approach. I don't know how to cut you open to do this. I just, just know how to do it with a scope. So I'm going to have to let you heal for a few weeks, and then you're going to have to come back, and we're going to give it another go, and we'll see how that one goes. Well, none of you would tolerate that, and we shouldn't expect our patients to tolerate it. And um, hopefully, if you tune into our future broadcast on, uh, on approaching uh, lateral window uh, science lifts, you'll see that, um, uh, that they're not that daunting and you shouldn't be intimidated by it. And if you have the right uh, approach, uh, right armamentarium to uh, sort out a lateral window, um, it becomes a very predictable and non-stressful procedure to do in the office for just about anybody. So um, if we're going to, I'll give you a rule here. If we're going to place a, a dental implant into, um, for immediate placement uh, into the alveolus and into the maxilla uh, with a concurrent sinus lift, whether it's lateral or um, crestal approach, we need to have five millimeters, five millimeters of height. 
And very quickly, uh, the reason is uh, when you make an osteotomy, create an osteotomy for an implant, typically the coronal portion of the osteotomy, uh, the, the part that is the neck or the crest mar- module of the tooth should be, pla- should be passive fit for the implant. Uh, if you think about it, the blood supply for the uh, crystal portion of the osteotomy comes from the periosteum, which we have just removed. Since we have removed that uh, blood supply, this bone does not have a good blood supply. It is very susceptible to pressure necrosis. So this portion should have a passive fit, and then primary stability is coming from here. And all your, if this was a into just nascent bone, typically the best is to have uh, all of your primary stability coming from the apical and middle thirds of an osteotomy for the implant, have a passive fit here, and then the middle third or so uh, is what you manipulate to account for uh, the different types of bone volume, uh, if it's dense or soft bone. Uh, we can, again, discuss that further on. But ideally, you'll need about five millimeters less than that, and you're starting to roll the dice. So if you have less than five millimeters, what to do? Um, in those cases, I recommend a, a lateral window approach and using concentrated growth factors with some sort of volumizer. And again, when it comes to a delayed uh, lateral approach and immediate lateral approach, we'll be uh, addressing those in, uh, uh, in another webinar. Uh, for today's discussion, uh, I'd like you to think about the information we're getting, uh, that we have a, somewhere between four and six millimeters uh, four or five millimeters of uh, crestal bone, and um, um, and uh, probably about six to seven millimeters minimum of uh, width. So you know the thing is, once we've popped in this implant, when we've turned it up, do we need to put bone in there? Well, there's several studies saying that no. Uh, the osteogenic potential of the of the periosteum, the Schneiderian membrane, once it's lifted, is 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 fantastic. So essentially, our goal is: do we just have to lift it somehow? Um, here are several studies: science floor augmentation with implant placement using Chokrin's plate, Chokrin's plate rich fibrin, uh, it's the early version of uh, concentrated growth factors, the sole grafting material. This is six months. Again, there's no problems. Um, uh, there's their bone formation is was particularly good. Uh, we saw this in this first study again here too. Uh, simultaneous science lift implant using uh, microthread implants and leukocyte rich uh, plate rich fibrin. Uh, again, that's Shokrin's proven uh, six month six year experience. Um, so all of these are dictating that uh, if we lift the membrane and we keep it tented up somehow, we don't really need to put any filling material into it. Uh, and again, another one using uh, fibrin blocks. This is concentrated growth factors. Uh, fibrin which, uh, blocks, which you'll see today's program, CGF, concentrated growth factors. That's uh, the fibrin blocks with CGF, sometimes referred to as CGF. Um, they're an alternative to bone grafting, can be predictable procedures or science grafting. Now, a quick note about bone grafting. Uh, typically, if, um, if we look down uh, at a dental implant uh, that's been placed into a fresh socket, let's say uh, a molar socket. And uh, that socket, uh, most likely the circumference of that socket is much wider than uh, the diameter of the implant. Um, if, you're, if, it's, if it's greater than by a millimeter to millimeter and a half, the blood clot that forms will not be stable. That blood clot w- cannot, cannot jump that gap, so to speak, between the diameter of the implant and the interior wall of the socket. If you place graft material into that socket, uh, that graft material becomes scaffolding to allow stability for the blood clot. Uh, and that's really what graft material, graft material does. It, uh, it, it basically becomes uh, stability uh, for the blood clot, and then also becomes an underlayment, if you will, a support for the barrier membranes that go over top of it. That's what graft material does. It doesn't really matter what you're putting into the socket. In, in this case, we're lifting a tent essentially, and it's tented up by the um, by the uh, implant. Um, the uh, CGF that we're going to use today uh, really just helps dissect the membrane off of the floor, uh, dissect the periosteum off the floor, and uh, helps promote uh, healing. That's all that it's doing uh, for us. The the real bone growth is occurring because the periosteum has been lifted 
or moved off of the sinus floor. So we'll start with the Metafuge. The Metafuge is, comes out of Italy. Um, the original uh, Shokrin's uh, PRF, uh, which is 2001, I believe, 2002, um, is uh, 2,700 RPM uh, for 12 minutes. Uh, the Metafuge uh, has um, improved on that a bit, in my opinion. Um, it does a variable spin down, uh, so it speeds up and spins down um, somewhere in that range. But it's able to concentrate all the growth factors um, into certain layers. Uh, I also think that the uh, uh, the fibrin blocks that are generated from the metafuge are uh, more robust than what you would get off of a tabletop centrifuge. Uh, and currently, there are really two types of CGF that you can fabricate. Uh, you have um, advanced PRF, uh, which is uh, Shokrin uh, has made with. Um, uh, a new centrifuge, which concentrates all the white blood cells into a uh, particular sample. And then you have the Metafuge here, which came out in 2006, the, uh, which is a variable spin down um, and concentrates all the growth factors. Um, both are excellent. Both centrifuges cost about the same. But I would tell you that whether it's APRF or, or concentrated growth factors, the variable spin downs uh, seem to produce better fibrin blocks. Um, and uh, I think uh, will be better than the original uh, protocols in just a tabletop centrifuge. So this is how we have it set up in our office. It's so just a little blood drawing cart. Uh, I use butterflies typically for these procedures. Um, usually for a case like this, a, a bilateral crestal approach, I'd want to have uh, three to four tubes. Uh, these tubes are between eight and 10 millimeters. 8 to 10 uh, milliliters of blood. And once they're completed, you have a few layers here. You have a red blood cell layer. You have the concentrated growth factors here, the fibrin block, and then the uh, 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 cytoplasm, platelet-poor cytoplasm. So no platelets here, uh, no platelets here. Um, uh, and you have some red uh, fractured red blood cells down in this area, which you'd like to stay away from. Having a little bit of the red blood cell layer here, which has all the concentrated growth factors, won't present any problems. People are quite concerned sometimes. They get rid of all the red blood cell layer. What you have to worry about with the red blood cell layer are the fractured portion, red blood cells, which can cause an inflammatory response. Those are down here, uh, up in this area. No problem to have a little red on the block, if uh, on, the, on the fibrin block, if you'd like to maintain some of the growth factors. Uh, this is a PRF uh, tray. Um, just a quick note on these trays. Um, the trays um, have a lid, and they have some sort of press, and then they have uh, some sort of perforations. All the trays are the same. When you sterilize these, uh, make sure your staff is putting barriers between this press and here. You can't have, whenever you're sterilizing, uh, it's uh, at least here in the U.S., uh, and if you're doing this uh, through... Uh, uh, through hospital specifications, you can't have a you can't have a flat portion against a flat portion. Uh, so it's very important to have some spacing uh, in through those areas. Uh, just a quick note for management for your staff. Here are the fibrin blocks. As you can see, uh, some of the red blood cell layers here. This is where all the growth factors are in this darker area. These are just set aside, and we'll get to it. Um, I am dissecting some of the red blood cell off of this, it looks like. Uh, so, um, and this is easily done. Um, uh, this just um, just peels off, really. You don't even need to cut it with scissors, as it's shown here. You can actually use a, the blunt end of a number nine periosteal elevator. So, we're going to use uh, something called expansion screws. Uh, expansion screws um, can be used uh, for edentulous ridge expansion. Uh, very handy for that. And they can also be used to impact the sinus floor. Um, there are several, uh, there used to be just a few kits out. This is a kit from the split control from Meisinger, uh, horribly expensive. Uh, I mean, this kit cost like $2,200 or something US uh, 10 years ago. Um, also, it wasn't set up exactly for sinus lifts. It was just made for expansions. You can see they have this uh, uh, Freddy Krueger drill here. Sorry for those of you outside the US that don't know Freddy Krueger. He's one of the horror flick monster guys, uh, uh, really, but the screws are quite nice. Um, so what I did with these screws um, on the larger sizes, if you'll take a look, I blunted these screws at the top to make them 
better for impacting the sinus floor. Actually, they're concave, just like the top of an osteotome. Uh, but rather than an osteotome that we're going to pound in to the jaw, we're going to rotate these screws at slow speeds. The smaller diameter screws I leave as pointy. Um, if you're using this for a ridge expansion kit, um, you don't need to have um, points on the ends of the larger screws. You just need the points, uh, the tapered end on the smaller screws as you're feeding the um, screws into the into your sinus uh, into your sinus um, uh, uh, into your in, in, I'm sorry, into your sinus into your ridge split. Uh, we'll also be doing a, a few more programs on ridge splits as well, which is a very handy um, a very handy piece of uh, uh, technical skill set to have in your office. Uh, so you can do quite a bit with these, and and there are screw sets available now for as little as four hundred dollars US, five hundred dollars US. Um, I think Implant Compare has uh, uh, has some vendors they can recommend you to if you don't know where to get them from. But um, make sure that they're flat on top on the wider diameters and modify them yourself if you have to uh, for the sinus procedure. Uh, this is our typical setup. Here is a surgery bone uh, piezo unit. Um, this is rainy Washington state in the winter. Uh, typically, we set things up uh, here like this. Um, I'll have an over table for the patient. Then I usually set up my implant motor uh, to the side. I'm left-handed. Um, I usually use uh, two scalpels for surgery. I use a, a 12D, which is uh, a dual-sided blade, and then a 15C. I like 15Cs because of the sharp point. Um, I like them better than just regular 15s. These are very nice if you have to release any periosteum uh, when you're closing a flap. Uh, these make it very nice, a sharp dissection. Um, this is the piezo tip that I'll be using. This is the handpiece of the piezo initially. Uh, essentially, this is a trephine, um, and it actually irrigates uh, from the tip uh, with saline and it makes a very gentle cut. Uh, the feel of this is is quite good um we'll discuss that in a second now typically if i'm going to uh, make a implant placement or a crystal any, any type of approach uh, uh, for grafting um, i usually use a crystal lingual approach uh, this will expose the entire table of the surgery site that we need uh, so we'll make a cravicular release here, crestal lingual approach here from line angle to line angle, line angle and then another cravicular release here. Um, a nice trick when using periosteo elevators is to use them like a, a fulcrum. So you can use uh, uh, your opposing hand finger underneath, and you can actually push with this finger while you're tipping back here. Uh, so basically, uh, it's like pushing end on one end of a seesaw, but moving the fulcrum up a bit. It's a very good controlled way uh, to raise flaps. A good, it's a very, uh, next time you have to raise a flap, go ahead and try this with two hands. Uh, it'll make a big difference. So I'm using a thumb or a finger here to basically push the back end of this, and then I'm fulcruming back with the other, other hand. Um, okay, this is a mirrored view. This is our, our, our table that we're working with. This is really quite nice, a nice crystal lingual approach, a very clean dissection, and now we have our full table to work with. So if anything happens, something breaks, uh, you, you fracture bone, uh, there's a problem, you actually will be able to get very good primary closure with this approach versus doing a mid-crestal approach. Now, uh, beginning uh, the procedure, uh, just right in the midline, uh, it's really, this is a pretty straightforward case. Uh, we're gonna go along, from our pre-surgery planning, um, uh, we'll go along the uh, midline, uh, both mesodistally and buccolingually, uh, right here. So right where that is, we'll be starting. Pretty straightforward. Uh, you could use a surgical guide for this. Many cases, uh, it's quite easy uh, to do this by eye. Um, you'll see that the tip is uh, has depth markers on it, and we know from the pre-surgical planning on the CT, which what this is what makes CT so valuable, exactly how deep, uh, how much distance there is from the crustal bone to the base of the sinus floor. So I can, uh, I can make that depth no problem. When you're using a piezo unit, what's quite nice about these is that, um, uh, especially when you're near um, the base of the sinus floor, uh, the inferior border of the sinus floor, which is up here, um, that's cortical bone. 
that's very dense cortical bone, and you can feel the difference uh, as this penetrates through here. And then uh, with very light pressure, um, it's very easy uh, to remove or thin that out um, without penetrating into the, into the floor. Now, uh, if this was Dr. Sohn's technique, uh, he would be making two incisions uh, in this area to uh, allow venting. And again, I, I find that a blind technique is difficult. I think his technique is very good once you master it. Um, I would say that um, uh, I would say that the technique we're about to show here, though, ubiquitously is is a bit easier for most providers to just pick up right off the bat. Uh, you could use a uh, any drill uh, that gets you within. Uh, you could use anything you want to get here. Uh, I would stop for sure, though, if you're using a drill um, or a trephine within about a millimeter to half a millimeter of the sinus floor. And this is the pilot right here. Now, these are the Meisinger screws. Um, as I, sorry, it's a little blurry, but what we've done is um, I blunted the end of the wider diameters. I hadn't touched the narrow diameter, so it's still pointy. Uh, if you were going to insert this into a ridge split, uh, this is very easy, uh, easily driven with the point. Here, uh, we're going to be, once you're getting into wider areas of the ridge split, it doesn't really matter about having this uh, pointed. Uh, so I just blunt these, and I have a kit now that can actually impact sinus and still do ridge splits. Very important to set your motor speed at 25 RPM. Any rotary instruments, any rotary instruments that are entering the alveolus, as long as the RPMs are under about uh, 50 RPM, you won't generate any heat. Uh, so, for instance, when I make actually osteotomies um, uh, for patients just for standard implants, I will make my pilot with the piezo uh, to the depth that I need to go. Um, once I've gotten to the depth of that, uh, for any standard implant placement. Um, I don't need to go any deeper. I just need to go wider. And it's very easily accomplished with uh, slow speed drilling at 25 or 50 RPM with no irrigation um, and quarter to half millimeter increments. And no heat's generated uh, from that by any means. So the screws today that we're using, we've done at 25 RPM. So here's the first screw. Uh, it's flat. Now we're placing a rather wide implant and the bone volume is fairly soft, so we can start right off with a wider screw. This screw is inserted and um, will penetrate approximately. So the first step is to get, uh, we'll go back up the steps here. The first step is to center our implant placement, obviously, uh, our, our pilot. And then either with a trephine or with a piezo unit, uh, something to get within about a millimeter to a half millimeter of the floor of the sinus. And then the first screw is used to impact through the floor of the sinus about um, a millimeter or so. You can confirm that either by the length of the screw, uh, if you have uh, CT planning, or you can do that with just a simple check film PA. In this case, um, I knew the exact measurement, and so I just I knew exactly at whatever it would have been, say, six millimeters, that that would have been a, when I'm at the six millimeter mark here. I know that I was within, I was one millimeter into the sinus. Now, once we've broken through the sinus, we have to check to make sure that we don't have a perforation. Uh, this is done very quick and easily uh, with a Valsava maneuver. Uh, have the patient blow their nose and uh, check for any air bubbles coming out of the uh, hole you just put into their jaw. And, you know, I get this all the time. Uh, how do you handle a perforation? Um, Simply, I just switched to a lateral window. Uh, we'll discuss how to manage perforations. In fact, I have a nice case uh, where we manage a perforation uh, from a, um, a using a Dr. Sohn's technique, actually. It was a, the sec I had, uh, used his technique two or three times with very good success. Fourth and fifth times, I end up getting some holes uh, in the Schneiderian membrane. Uh, that's not a critique on his, on his uh, technique. That's a critique on my abilities. Uh, but very quickly was able to switch to a uh, lateral window and, and complete both cases, and we'll review those uh, uh, in a, another webinar. So here are CGF clots, concentrated growth factors, or PRF, LPRF. Uh, so LPF is leukocyte-rich, platelet-rich fibrin. Uh, CGF is concentrated growth factor, fibrin blocks. Uh, if these were APRF, advanced platelet-rich fibrin, they would look exactly the same. Uh, the block 
Now, just to refresh your memory, we uh, have impacted the floor of the science by one millimeter, and we're going to place these uh, fibrin blocks, uh, which are quite squishy, for lack of a better term, uh, into, into the area. We're going to drive them up with another screw. Um, and this time the screw is going to go to full length uh, uh, of what you need for the implant. Now, the fibrin blocks, when they are inserted, once they are pushed into the socket, they, they really are slick. I mean, you can hold these in your hands and squeeze them, and they, it's like holding like a, a ball of Teflon. Um, they will move laterally and dissect the membrane up very nicely for you uh, almost 100% of the time. And if you're using slow speeds on these, um, on these expansion screws, uh, you're going to have a very, very, very high success rate uh, uh, of these cases. Uh, the other nice thing about using uh, uh, CGF, uh, using fibrin blocks, is that if you end up having a tear, it's just a blood clot. And the tear usually is fairly small and will most likely heal very well. So there's a lot of advantage to using just a fibrin block and no graft material. Again, we'll check once that's done to length, once that's placed to length, we'll check again to make sure that there's no uh, air leakage uh, coming from the patient's uh, surgery site. Now, th so we've done the last, use the last uh, area to length and the last diameter also, which matches uh, our implant. Now, what I've mentioned before is that we want to have a, um, we want to have a passive fit for the first two millimeters of this implant. So I'm using a countersink here, uh, which I, looks like is five millimeters. I, I think I'm placing a five millimeter implant uh, diameter in this site. Um, so this is two millimeters of this will be passive, and then three millimeters will be engaging the implant. So again, uh, we're using a countersink right in this area to have a passive fit. And then in this area, um, we will have um, um, uh, our, our primary stability. And in this portion, again, the floor of the sinus is uh, uh, cortical bone. So at some point, even if you were to have a failure, you have bicortical stabilization with cortical bone here and cortical bone here. So we are using a Surgicore implant. This is an implant company I've been involved with. Uh, Surgicore is a new company. Uh, we have uh, several designs, um, platform switched implants, uh, flat bottoms, which are very good for impacting sinuses. Uh, we'll talk more about those in later podcasts. Um, so now we've done the final, um, we've placed, uh, so just to recap, we have uh, taken one screw. Step one, we've, step one is we've gotten to uh, one millimeter of the floor of the sinus. Step two, we've used a screw to impact a millimeter into the sinus. Uh, step three, uh, we're placing CGF uh, in through here and uh, dissecting the sinus even further uh, to length. Uh, now, step four, we're going to place the implant, and we're still going to place more CGF in through here and have the implant drive the CGF uh, into uh, the area. And I like to use screwdriver handles a lot to place the implants. Um, really important in these areas, you, you need, you know, if something was to slip, um, let's say that the bone volume was very soft. If you're doing this with a, with a motor, you're not going to have the same feel as you would uh, with your hand, you want the same dexterity, and you could very easily, if there was a problem, impact or intrude the entire body of the implant into the sinus. So I would really recommend hand ratcheting or screwdriver. Uh, it also gives you really a good way to maintain the trajectory of the implant. Uh, I, I think that using a screwdriver is, is really essential for a lot of implant placements. I think it's overlooked a lot. Uh, again, a, a lot of um, a lot of companies uh, really push uh, using a handpiece to do this. Um, I think uh, there really is a lot to be said to being able to assess the primary stability by hand. Uh, lining the trajectory very nicely is very easy. Um, but we can talk about that more in other seminars. So this, again, showing the trajectory where the implant is placed. We're placing the implant um, uh, approximately three millimeters apical to our planned gingival margin. So here's our planned gingival margin. The implant will be three millimeters, uh, approximately two to three millimeters below that. Uh, this is uh, the uh, surgical implant uh, called the immediate. 
Um, one nice thing to notice also uh, this immediate that uh, the surgical implant comes in both a hex or a conic deep conical. Here's the hex version. Uh, always for whatever implant system you're using, uh, have the flat side or indexing always toward the buckle because that's how your future abutments will be oriented. Um, replacing a CGF uh, clot over top of the area once the cover screw is done to facilitate healing. Um, I use, uh, uh, for closing, um, I use um, a, a DeBakey. It's an untooth pickup. It's like a wider version of uh, maybe a typical dental um, forcep. Uh, and then uh, I like Castro Viejos for suturing. Uh, for closing, um, I like to use um, vertical mattress sutures in the corners and uh, vertical mattress sutures here, horizontal mattress here. Um, I'm going to put together another webinar actually on integral suturing, uh, which I think will be quite handy and useful for many of the providers there. And we'll show some uh, ways to, to use different types of sling sutures and such for various graft materials and uh, for opening um, Op uh, for uncovering implants, etc. So again, uh, horizontal mattress, uh, vertical mattress. And also in larger flaps, you can release the periosteum right here, uh, which is very easily done with a 15C. Um, that removes the tension in the system. Uh, this collagen, there are collagen fibers here uh, in the periosteum, and uh, for larger wounds, those will retract significantly, causing your flap to pull open. But if you just release this lightly, just very lightly, you release the tension in the system without affecting the blood supply and close, you'll be in very good shape. And this is the implant placed. Uh, you can see, we, in fact, here's the bone. Here's the bone we impacted from the floor of the sinus. You can see the sinus membrane, uh, really well contained. Uh, the left side uh, was done as well, number 14. And look at our post-op CT scan. And we have a very nice elevation of uh, the Snyderian membrane, uh, the periosteum. Here's the bone that was impacted from the screw. Um, and on the left side, uh, the same thing. Uh, here's the bone that was impacted from the screw. And then here's the CGF and through here. Uh, these septum, uh, we'll discuss, uh, these septum were really no problem because we had a good coal through here on both sides. So uh, in closing, uh, please uh, keep in mind what is we have to do, what are your objectives, understand what you're doing, and then regardless of what you come across, uh, you'll be able to handle it. Um, it makes, uh, makes life a lot easier uh, to try and have a good firm understanding of the concepts of what you're trying to achieve. And then, you know, using a kit, I mean, <laughs> using a snow stake, uh, uh, some bits and pieces of uh, runner and rope uh, to do whatever, uh, you're in uh, you're in uh, you're in good shape. So for our science augmentation steps, again, we have to access the alveolus somehow, get to the bone. Then we have to get to the sinus cavity. Then we have to manipulate the soft tissue somehow to lift it, uh, to tent it, if you will. Um, graft selection, which we discussed, and implant placement simultaneously delayed. Um, just in closing, um, I have to tell you. Um, the last several years, we've we've been using a lot of shorter implants in the practice, a lot of five and six miller implants uh, with really excellent success. And um, I think there's something to be said for that. Um, and there's some research now, this is just from 2015, um, basically asking, is it better to place a five by eight uh, and do a science lift or five by 10 and do a science lift than it is doing the five by six? And you know, I think there's a lot of considerations that go into that. Uh, one is the type of bone volume you're working in, which you wouldn't know unless you had a, a CT. Um, uh, you know, what's the, what are the comorbidities? Is a patient uh, is a patient medically complex? Uh, are, uh, are there risks of significant infection or bleeding? Uh, you know, are they on chemo? Uh, are are they uh, anticoagulated? Uh, you know, for DVT or uh, uh, AFib. So, you know, I think there's a lot of considerations, and, and the more tricks you have in your bag, as I said, the better off uh, you're going to be. Uh, so have a good understanding. Uh, I hope you'll tune into some of our future programs. Um, uh, I know that uh, Implant Compare in the next co coming months are looking at um, having uh, interactive sessions, either uh, somehow for questions and answers uh, after the programs. 
Uh, if you have any questions, uh, the best is contact me uh, via my website. Uh, this is our office website, uh, www.lcoh.net. Um, or you can email me directly. Uh, it's drhagigi, so dr and then h-a-g-h-i-g-h-i at lcoh.net. Just those four letters. Same here, lcoh.net. So drhagigi, one word, at lcoh.net. Uh, look forward to uh, discussing any cases with you, and uh, thanks for your time. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend.